Each week at St. Paul's, we have a worship service at 10 a.m. You can join us on Zoom or you can join us in person. If you're joining us on Zoom, we ask you to come on at 9.30 so we can have a time of Zoom fellowship before the service starts. We also send out a weekly video, and this is the video for June 11th, 2023. We're starting a new series on the five books of Moses, and this is our second week. We're looking at the second chapter of Genesis. We have a guest preacher on Sunday, Reverend Kimberly McNair. And Kimberly McNair has worked at churches in Bedford, Presbyterian churches, Baptist churches. She currently works at My Sister's Place, which is an agency that serves survivors of domestic intimate partner violence. And so we're interested in hearing about her ministry and about her story, her ministry that works around issues of poverty and violence. Next week is a Juneteenth celebration in the town of Portchester. This is something that has been kind of evolving over years. Um, it started as a way of remembering the uh, victims of Emmanuel, Mother Emmanuel Church, the nine members of the church who were shot during a, a Bible study. Um, so we started doing kind of a Juneteenth celebration as a way to commemorate them and, uh, and other people who had been murdered in uh, violence like that. Um, so, but now it's expanded into being nationally recognized as a federal holiday. So lots of places are doing Juneteenth celebrations. Um, and ours continues to be a time um, to reflect on our nation's history and our nation's struggle to make progress. So I hope you can join us for that. And here is the prayer of the day. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the source of life and the ground of our being. By the power of your spirit, bring healing to this wounded world and raise us to the new life of your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. This is our second week looking at the creation stories in Genesis, and here is a creation story from John. Good news according to John, the first chapter, the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overtake it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. A reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 2, another account of creation. Last week we read chapter 1. Comparing chapters 1 and 2, we see two... <clears throat> Last week, we read chapter 1. Comparing chapters 1 and 2, we now see there are two distinct and divergent stories. Last week's story began with God moving over the waters. Today, we begin with a scene that is parched. Last week, we heard of a creation that unfolded with God doing nothing more than speaking over the six days. Today's version takes us only one day, and the Lord God seems to be an artisan, gardener, and surgeon, not just a voice. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the face of the whole ground, then the Lord God fashioned the human, Adam, from the dust of the ground, Adama, and breathed into their nostrils the breath of life. And the human became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there God put the human whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there divides and becomes four branches. The Lord God took the human and put them in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the human, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat of it, you shall die. 
Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the human should be alone. I will make for them a sustainer beside them. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the human to see what they would call them. And whatever the human called each living creature, that was its name. The human gave names to all the cattle, to all the birds of the air, and to every animal of the field. But for the human no sustainer beside them was found. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the human, and they slept. Then the Lord God took one of the ribs and closed up in its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the human he fashioned into a woman and brought her to the human. Then the human said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, Isha, for out of man, Ish, this one was taken. Therefore, does a man leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, they become one flesh. And the human and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. So as I mentioned, this chapter two reading gives us a sense that there are two side-by-side -side stories of creation. In the first one, it takes six days, chapter one. Chapter two, creation takes a day. Everything happens in a day. In chapter one, God's face moves over the surface of the waters. In chapter two, Everything is dry because God had not made it rain yet. And then God brings forth a river and then God makes people. God in the second chapter makes people and then makes a garden and then makes animals. In chapter one, God made the plants and then the animals and then people, the exact opposite order. Plants, animals, people, in chapter one, chapter two, people, plants, animals. So there's a way in which you're, you're made to really see that these are two stories that do not line up. These are two stories that do not have the same way of understanding what happened at creation. Not the same amount of time, not the same sequence. And there's all this reference to the Lord God. Whereas in chapter one, it just said God. In chapter two, it says the Lord God, the Lord God. So it's a different way of referring to God. You could say it's a different theology. In the first chapter, God speaks, let there be light, and it was so. In the second chapter, the Lord God planted a garden. He got out there with a shovel and with a hoe and started planting. And he opens up Adam and pulls out a rib like he is a surgeon. The Lord God took one of the ribs and closed up in his place. It's like he's a surgeon. It's like he's an architect designing this new world. And he's getting his hands dirty and doing the work. He's forming a person out of the dirt. It's like a potter taking the clay. He's taking the dirt, the dust, and making a person. This God is with his hands in the dirt, as opposed to just this disembodied voice in the first chapter. So what we're seeing then is precisely what the subtitle says in your Bible. If you open your Bible and it's uh, the New Revised Standard Version, you'll see this subheading most likely, another account of creation. What this means is there is not one account of creation. In the first two chapters of the Bible, we're told there is not one account of creation. And what does that mean? There are only two? No. We read in John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That is a third account of creation. And if you look in the book of Job, there's another account of creation. The womb burst forth the oceans in Job. And in the Psalms, you hear another version of creation. So there are like four or five different versions of creation just in our own Bible. You don't have to go to another Bible from another religion. In our Bible are multiple versions of creation. And that's what we're told right in the beginning, the first two chapters, there is not one account of creation. So for all these people who want to insist that you have to understand creation literally, just as it happens in the Bible, there is not one literal story of creation. 
there is not one story of creation. There are multiple stories. And if there are multiple in the Bible, why can't we have a scientific description of evolution? If there's not one version of creation, how can you say that anyone's version is not allowed because it doesn't line up with the one that you see, the one that you think you have in the Bible? The other thing that's interesting about this is the idea <clears throat> of a man. So we hear this word in many Bible translations. It says the man did this and the man did that. So the word there is not the word for man. So if you look, I'm sorry, I'm scrolling so much. But if you look here in chapter 2, you get all the way to the 23rd verse when we hear man. This is the first time the word man appears right here. For out of man, ish is the Hebrew, this one was taken. Before that is a different word. And in your Bible, it may say man, 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 man. But if the, you're looking at the Hebrew, what it says is Adam. And it doesn't just say Adam, it says the Adam. Yeah, I mean, I'm giving you the, the, you know, the definitive article from English, but it would be in Hebrew. But in English, it's the human. And what does this word human mean? We're kind of translating but it looks like what this word means is something like humus, soil, dirt. That it's a variation of that word because the word for soil or dirt is Adama. And it seems like the Bible very often has these puns where something that sounds the same is used to connect something to something else. So God took the dirt, the soil, the Adama, and made Adam. So one way of translating that, as opposed to a gender-specific term, is human. That it was a human. It wasn't a gendered person. It wasn't pers a person with one gender or another gender. It wasn't a man or a woman. It was a human. Another way to translate this word Adam in a way that gets across this point that it's talking about soil and dirt, it's been suggested, earthling. That God fashioned an earthling. We think of an earthling as someone who is from the planet Earth. In the Bible, we're not talking about a planet. We're talking about an Earth that's flat in the Bible. That's the Bible's understanding of the cosmos. The stars are little specks of light in the sky in the Bible. They're not stars in other galaxies. So earthling, because the Earth is flat, the Earth is dirt. We use that word Earth, right, to talk about a round planet, a globe, but we also use the word dirt. They would use the word earth as they do here in the Bible to talk about the dirt, the soil, the earth. So that you might say God fashioned an earthling from the earth. To kind of get across this idea of Hebrew, which is that Adam came from Adama. That, that's kind of what we're talking about here. And then when we get to chapter 20, when we get to verse 23, <coughs> then this one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. So it's going to be a long time before Adam is the Adam of Adam. Now, actually, I said that the wrong way. This is the Adam, and later on we're going to get to Adam, a, a proper name. But it's the same word, but it's just putting that article in front of it to make it not a, a category, but an individual. So in this chapter two, it's the Adam, the human, the earthling. And then later on in chapter four, I think it gets to be Adam without the Adam. So that now you're talking about a person. At that point, Adam gives Eve a name. And then suddenly we just start referring to Adam no longer with the definitive article. And that's when the Bible starts translating it as Adam. And not the human or the man, <clears throat> as, some, as some do. So that's just something I wanted to point out because I think that's important to understand that there is not one story of creation in the Bible and that people who insist on literally describing a creation story that nobody can disagree with, the Bible disagrees on how creation happened. How can we say you can't disagree with the Bible's version of creation when the Bible itself disagrees? Did everything start out wet? Well, yes, if you look at chapter one. Did everything start out dry? That's how it started out if you look at chapter two. 
Did God make people first and then plants and animals? Well, that's what it says in chapter two, but chapter one, plants and then animals and then people. So there's a way in which it's deliberately trying to give you contradictory forms of the story of creation in order to say one thing. There's not one version of the story of creation. Not that there's two, but that there's not one. There's more than two. So I just wanted to share that. And I think that's important to start out the Bible and say, we're not reading literal stories that people are going to pass laws and saying, you can't disagree with this story of creation because it's in the Bible. The Bible itself is telling us multiple stories from different points of view, different ways of referring to God. Is God God? As in chapter one, chapter two keeps saying the Lord God, consistently saying the Lord God. Chapter one keeps saying consistently the just God. Chapter one is consistently God said, God said, God said. We don't have any picture of God, just God speaking words. Chapter two, God is taking the dirt and forming the dirt and breathing into the dirt. You're picturing God's hands and God's mouth and God's lungs making this person. God is planting a garden like a farmer. God is pulling out a rib and then covering up the flesh like a surgeon. That God has arms and legs and lips and lungs is a kind of a very human image of God in chapter two. Different kinds of ways of describing God, different names for God. So I think that's an important way to start the Bible, realizing that it can't be literal. It can't be you insisting on one version. The Bible itself is saying there's multiple versions and there are different ways of getting across the truth. And that these stories are just ways of getting across truth, that the truth is beneath these stories, not the, in the facts of the stories, but the truth comes through your reading of the story and asking questions of it. So that's a, <coughs> that's a brief message for this Sunday. Um, tune in on Sunday to hear a sermon from Reverend Kim McNair. Now I'm going to show you a video of last week's service. And I'm sorry that the audio is not so good because we had two readers reading the first chapter and I didn't have two microphones. I didn't think about that. Um, so it's a little hard to read, but it's all printed on the screen. So you can, you can kind of follow the Genesis 1 reading from last week there. So I hope you enjoy that music and the prayers and the message from last week.
Good morning. If anyone is interested in uh, helping out with Midnight Run, Midnight Run is an organization that goes down into Manhattan uh, with a caravan that has clothes and food to hand out to people who are living on the street. Uh, Midnight Run is asking for the group that's going this week for donations of socks and shirts and soap and toothpaste and shoes and granola bars and individual wrapped snacks. Um, so if you wanna get it to the next one, the donations are due by June 7th. And this is something that goes on all the time, but uh, Port Chester High School and the Carver Center are doing one this week. And if we uh, get the items to them, they will be taking them down. Uh, our deacon is not with us. He's with his wife at uh, St. Barnabas today, and we're glad uh, to share them um, as they're helping other churches. And everybody saw the beautiful roses outside, and we thank Max for those beautiful roses. And maybe you saw the pansies and the other flowers. Uh, we thank uh, Dave Palastro for those beautiful um, additions to our garden. We have our tag sale and car wash coming right up. And it's gonna be on Sunday, June 11th, noon to 12.30. I think the tag sale goes to three. Um, and if you have items you'd like to donate, you can bring them in and we'll have them for the tag sale. Um, so if you have stuff that's uh, good that people would like to buy, clothing, household items, uh, you wanna donate, you can bring them by. The car wash, um, we've donated the money from the car wash to different organizations. Um, we donated the first time to Nephronic Syndrome uh, Foundation. Uh, we've donated it to the Gay Straight Alliance at the high school. We've donated it to the Ali Forney Fund Foundation. Uh, this year, the car wash money is going to Center Lane, uh, which works to support LGBT youth in Westchester. And the TXL money will be for the church. And I think that's all the announcements we need right now. Yeah. I want to say hello to Julia and to Norma and to Linda and to Chip and to Lori J and Barbara J and to Curtis and Courtney and Calvin and Cora, who will be here next week for Cora's baptism. We're going to begin with our confession and forgiveness found on page three. If you are able to stand with me, I invite you to stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the maker of heaven and earth, the word made flesh, the Lord and giver of life. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Almighty God in mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. <laughs>
Gracia del nuestro Señor Jesucristo, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the amor de Dios, the love of God, y la comunión del Espíritu Santo, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, sean con ustedes, be with you all. Let us pray. Holy Trinity, you are a community unified as one, in love as one God, our holy three in one. You are the triune God, author of creation, eternal word of salvation, life-giving spirit of wisdom. Keep us steadfast in faith that we may know your endless joy and love. Amen. Please be seated. First reading is from Genesis chapter 18. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. And now we have another Genesis reading. So you'll notice in our Genesis reading next that there is a part for all. And that's uh, something we ask you to cooperate with. So we have two microphones. You want to take the open? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Oh, I'll, I'll climb the stairs. <laughs> Let there be light. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the water under the dome from the waters of the dome. And it was so. God called the dome the sky. And there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together to call seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was and it was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves at every time, with which the waters form, and every winged bird at every time. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made wild animals of the earth of every kind, and cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image, in the image of God created them, male and female created them. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heaven and the earth were finished, and on, and, on, and on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day in all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day out of it, because on it God rested in all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Holy wisdom, holy Thanks be to God. God.
the good news according to John, the third chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Just as Moses lifted up the, ser the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Jesus Christ. So on Memorial Day, for the past 13 years, you know I've been here 13 years? Doesn't seem like it's been 13 years until I look at my kids and I'm like, oh, it's been a long time. So every year on Memorial Day, I join in a little group that goes to the war memorials in Port Chester and Rybrook. There's about nine of them. We start down at the marina where they throw flowers onto the water and remember those sailors who died in service to their country. So I've been doing that for about 13 years. And I haven't always been invited, but I've always shown up because it's always public and it's always publicized. And I haven't always been asked to participate, but I've always been there gladly, joining along, traveling from the Civil War Memorial to the Spanish-American War Memorial, to the Korean Memorial, to the Vietnam Memorial, to all of the various memorials that we have. And thinking that that's a very important thing to do on Memorial Day, uh, to remember these people who died and the families that they've left behind. I think it's kind of a pastor's appreciation for the proper honoring of death and a pastor's way of supporting people in their grief it also, though, raises issues of church and state because it happens to be organized by the village. And it used to be kind of organized by a former mayor, but more recently it's been the current mayor who kind of organizes it. But it's a nice combination of veterans and elected officials. And I've always thought that it's important for someone from the local clergy to participate. And when I have been asked, to participate, I've always also referred them to the rabbi and to any other ministers that are available so that there's a good multiplicity of different faiths who participate. So in recent times, when they've asked me to join a prayer, they have someone who hands out flags to people so everyone gets a flag. And I've declined holding that flag for two reasons. One is that I have to hold the microphone and then I'm holding a prayer book. And then when they tell everybody to take off their hats, I have to take my hat off. So I've got my hat and my prayer book and the microphone. And so it's a little awkward. I know I don't want to put down the flag. I don't have any place to put my hat down. But for another reason as well, that I don't want to merge national identity and my particular faith identity. And I think there's ways in which we can have them coexist and complement each other, but there's also ways in which they can be kind of merged together in a way that's not healthy. It's important to remember at a time like that, that not all Christians are American, and that we should understand that idea that God sees the world as creation. And more importantly, that not all Americans are Christian. So that to kind of merge your Christianity together with your patriotism, with your partisanship, is an unhealthy thing that ends up excluding people. Or making one group a first-class group and other groups second-class. So it's not always understood. And when this year when they came to me with the flag, I said, well, I'm not going to hold the flag while I'm praying. And she kind of was like, what? What's wrong with holding a flag while you're praying? because some people get very kind of, you know, righteous about their patriotism. So I explained to her that I don't want to present an image that mixes different symbols from faith and from patriotism. And we see today people who do that, they merge their particular kind of Christianity with their particular kind of Americanism. 
in a way that is kind of, I think, one of those times when you see an inappropriate mixing. We've seen people who mix their religion and their fanaticism. They hijack a religion and they use it in the cause of terrorism or partisanship or political advancement or making money. Today is Trinity Sunday. It's a Sunday when we think about how confounding God is. And it's an important reminder when we try to think of God as being God is exactly who I know God is and agrees with all of my beliefs and God is on my side. Trinity Sunday is a day that says God is so beyond our understanding. God is so beyond our agendas, our partisanship, whatever our particular values are. It's important that we remember that. And Trinity Sunday is that day that says that God is three and God is one. God is the God of the Old Testament and the God of our Christian faith. There's so much to God that we don't understand. I love Abraham Lincoln's use of Christian and biblical symbols and understandings. Abraham Lincoln didn't have a particular denomination. He didn't have a church upbringing. But he was someone who was self-taught, and part of his self-education was learning about the Bible, so that when he said things like four score and seven years, he was using a biblical way of referring to time. His speeches were always filled with biblical or, or faith references. And during the Civil War, he said, both sides are praying to the same God. And God is not going to answer the prayers of both sides because this side is praying, let us win and defeat our enemies. And this side is saying, let us win and defeat our enemies. So he had this important understanding of the complexity of faith and the limits of faith and the proper role of faith, that we don't remove faith from public life, but we're very thoughtful about how we share it. So Trinity is a time to remember God is beyond our understanding, outside of our agenda. The Trinity emphasizes mystery, that God is beyond rational understanding of math. So it discourages a kind of a narrow definition of this who is what, who God is, and this is what God stands for, and this is how God is on my side, this is how God agrees with my ideology. It's a time to remember that when God looks down from heaven, God doesn't see borders. God doesn't see nationalities. God didn't make a world with borders. God made a world with a beautiful pluralistic society with people choosing their faith, choosing language, choosing, choosing food, choosing culture, and having that freedom. So we had Laura very graciously agree to, to read today, taking the part of God. And Ronnie has to live with her for the next week, knowing that she's going to be feeling that. She did that once 10 years ago. And as we were showing up at church, I mentioned to a beloved member of ours who's no longer with us, oh, Laura is going to be reading today, and she's reading the part of God. And he looked at her and he said, you don't look like God. And I said, that's the point that we have a very specific idea of what God looks like, male, white, elderly. It's amazing how thoroughly we can identify our Christian faith with European images and culture. When that's not where Christianity comes from, it's not where Christianity is limited to today. So let me give you another example that I shared with this woman at Memorial Day, as I was trying to explain to her that I was not against the flag or patriotism, I was there for Memorial Day, that I've seen on social media people selling these medallions that are crosses, and the crosses are red, white, and blue covered, so that it's a, it's a cross that has the colors of the flag on it. So that's a way in which, very symbolically, people have merged their national identity and their faith. And I said to her, I said, I don't think that's a proper way to show the cross, and I don't think it's a proper way to show the flag. Because again, not all Americans are Christian, and not all Christians are American. And more importantly, because there are people who are merging their kind of Christianity as an exclusive, intolerant kind of Christianity, and their understanding of America, which is very often racist and sexist 
and exclusive into something that is called Christian nationalism. And that's when you realize just where people can go when they merge an ethnic identity, a national identity, a partisanship with a faith. Christian nationalism, as we're seeing it more and more, is a kind of rebranded white nationalism. And we realize that there's some people that that's their agenda. And again, I remember Abraham Lincoln who talked about a new birth of freedom for a country that didn't include everyone and was going to work towards including more and more people. To be that nation of the people, by the people and for the people, it needed to be reborn to do that, to accomplish that, because we didn't do that at the beginning. So kind of what I'm talking about is this idea that there is a wall of separation between church and state, which that term is not a precise term. And maybe sometimes it's not helpful. What we have as Americans is a constitutional guarantee that the government will not establish a religion, that our government will neither promote a religion or hinder a religion or religions or faith in general. So I don't think a wall is a, is a helpful image to kind of separating, but to say that each of those has their proper place. So that I think it's appropriate for me to go to Memorial Day and to be honoring our country and to honoring those people who died in service of their country. And I always make sure that the rabbi is invited or any other ministers are invited. I think that's important. The fire department has me as a chaplain and they have the rabbi as a chaplain. The police department in Port Chester has a Buddhist chaplain. And I think those things are important. To include faith and not in any way that privileges any faith but that welcomes all faiths. So not everybody gets that. And we hear this term Christian nationalism. If you listen to what they're talking about, you'll hear people say things like, one former national security advisor, we are one nation, we have to have one religion. We are one nation under God, that means one religion. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about excluding other faiths. And they're not just talking about excluding non-Christians, they're talking about narrowly defining Christianity to what they understand Christianity to be about. There's a state down south that's talking about replacing the school guidance counselors with school chaplains. Replacing, taking out the guidance counselors and putting in school chaplains. That's not the way Americans understand the relationship between church and state. We don't believe in having organized prayer in school. That doesn't mean that we're taking God out of school. That doesn't mean that people can't pray in school. I'm sure everyone is praying all the time in schools. It means that they don't organize a prayer. I sent my kids to public school. I thought that was a great experience for them. I didn't have that experience growing up. I went to parochial school, elementary school, high school, college. I wasn't prepared for the plurality of society that I was going to meet when I graduated. I had to start learning about different people in different faiths and, and what the appropriate way was to talk to people and to understand something about them. I wanted my kids to have that pluralistic understanding of the society that they have to live in. And for that reason, I didn't want their teachers teaching them how to pray. I didn't want their public school teachers telling them what to believe. I didn't want their public school teachers telling them what to understand about what part of the Bible that they wanted to emphasize. Because their teachers were Quakers and Mormons and atheists, and that was the plurality that I wanted them to have. I didn't want somebody else teaching another kind of Christianity to them. And that's what we mean when we don't want to have organized prayer in public schools. We don't want to have schools promoting faith. I was invited to go to my kid's school to talk about Christianity, on a panel that had a rabbi and an imam, and we talked about our different faiths, and I thought that was appropriate. So I don't think it's helpful to talk about a wall that separates, but to talk about the appropriate role for each. Last week, we talked about Pentecost, about maybe this idea that the Holy Spirit is invisible, that the Holy Spirit is not the face of Jesus, that the Holy Spirit is not Michelangelo's God the Father, but actually we do see the Holy Spirit when we see at church, all of us gathered here together. 
when we see how God works in bringing people together to pray and sending people to be of service to others. That is a visible sign of God. So God is both this transcendent God and God is also right here with us. Our faith is not about coercion. As Christians, we don't believe in coercion, and yet there have been plenty of Christians who have tried to coerce people, but that's not who we are supposed to be. And we need to be reminded of that because we've made that mistake in the past. Our faith is not about absolutism. It's not about excluding other people. Our faith is about inclusion. We have in America the freedom of our faith, a freedom to believe or not to believe as we choose. And Christians also respect that idea of freedom, especially Lutherans, this idea of grace that we live in a freedom that God has given us. That is a beautiful, blessed combination to live in a country that respects our faith to believe as we choose and to have a religion that says God is setting you free from sin and death. They complement each other so well, like not a lot of other countries do in this world. And yet so many people want to merge those into a narrow understanding of my faith and my partisanship and my idea of a narrow patriotism, which is often exclusive of race and religion and sexual orientation. They can be a great complement. Our faith is not about coercion. We believe in a God who is love. How do we learn about this Trinity, this concept of the Trinity? We're going to recite the Nicene Creed. It's so complicated, these words, and they're so specific sometimes about a God who is so beyond our understanding. We learn about God when we see people in their freedom, in their freedom to create music and art, to express what's in their soul. We learn about God from creativity, from art, from love, and from suffering. When people struggle and they find a way to see how God is with them. That is what the Trinity is about. It's about not a narrow, simplistic understanding of our faith, that's self-serving, but a humble appreciation for what God has given us and the beautiful creation, the diversity of creation, the society that we live in, that we're so blessed to live in.
we continue on page six with our creed, let us profess our faith with this ancient creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified unto Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Rooted in Christ and inspired by the Holy Spirit, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all of creation. Holy Trinity, hold this world in your tender embrace, especially those impacted by the opioid epidemic. We remember those afflicted and especially those who have lost loved ones to the COVID virus. May we be thankful, loving God, for healthcare workers and first responders. Each of us has a way to serve you by loving and helping our neighbor. Remind us of our mission to be your hands for people in need. Holy Trinity, gracious God, send your spirit to lead us. Loving Savior, hear our prayers for places of flooding and wildfires, train wrecks, Help us to reach out in assistance. We pray for people in war-torn countries, victims of terrorism, both foreign and domestic. We pray for and reach out to refugees in compassion. Holy Lord Jesus, the stranger among us, we pray for the misunderstood and marginalized. Holy Trinity, gracious God. Bless our Child Care Center staff, advisory committee, and families. We thank you for this inspiring mission to and with our community. May we each discover how the talents that you have graced us with can be used to your glory. Holy Trinity, gracious God, send your spirit to lead us. Merciful God, hear us as we join our prayers together to lift up Angie, Marit, Bill, Paul, Max, Julia, Dan, Dennis, Earl, Erica, Marcia, and Rick, Phil, Jamie, Muriel, Kay, Idalia, Julissa, Pat, Bob and Suzanne, Johnny, Arlene, Michael, John, Tessa, Linda, Sandy, Dan, Ernesto, Deborah, William, Connie, Michael. Holy Trinity, gracious God, send your spirit to the us. Bless all who mourn the loss of loved ones, including the families of Dennis, Dan, John, Charlize, David, Betty, and Robert. Bless Victoria and Fabian who are expecting their first child and Courtney and Curtis on the birth of their second child, Cora, who will be with us for baptism next week. We rejoice for those celebrating birthdays, especially Michael, Ron, Daisy, Aurora, and Stephanie. Holy Trinity, gracious God. Bless our Metropolitan New York Bishop, our Synod staff and Synod Council. Bless our choir and musicians, altar guild, lectors, communion assistants, ushers, acolytes, deacons, and greeters. May we reach out <clears throat> to other houses of worship and community partners to discover how we give praise and honor to you with lives shaped by your mercy and steadfast love. Holy Trinity, gracious God. 
We lift these and all our prayers to you, O God, confident in the promise of your saving love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So turn to the person next to you with prayer hands or peace fingers behind you, in front of you, beside you to offer your peace. Please be seated. The ushers will now come by if you want them to collect your envelope, hold it up, and you see all the electronic options in your bulletin. Let us pray. Holy God, we offer the gifts of our hearts and lives to the service of all your people. Prepare the way before us as we meet you in this simple meal through Jesus Christ, our pathway and our peace. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary and a joyful thing that we always and everywhere offer thanks and praise to you, O God, through Jesus Christ. Christ is the one who was handed over to a death he freely accepted in order to destroy death. He took bread and gave thanks. He broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which will be given for you. In the same way, he took the cup, and again he gave thanks, and he gave the cup for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It will be shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering then his death and resurrection, we take this bread and cup, giving you thanks that you have made us worthy to stand before you, and serve you as your priestly people. We remember our Lord's victory over death, and we give thanks for all the saints of blessed memory now celebrating this meal in the heavenly presence of their creator, sanctifier, and redeemer. Send your spirit upon these gifts of your church. Gather into one all who share this bread and wine. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to establish our faith in truth, that we may praise and glorify you to your Son, Jesus Christ, through whom all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God, the kingdom, power, and glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. In Christ, we are all one Thank you. 
May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen us and keep us in his peace. Amen. I want to thank everyone who helped this morning. Our lectors, our ushers, Russell, our Zoom usher. Um, Cam, that was Cam's first time reading in church. Is that the first time you read in any church or just this church? And first time reading in church, any... And how many people on their first time reading in church get up into the pulpit? So I think he and Laura did rock, paper, scissors, and Cam lost. Uh, so again, the car wash and tag sale you see in your bulletin. Uh, next Sunday, we have Cora, who's watching now. And she's muted, so maybe she's singing out loudly. Um, so Cora's going to be with us next week for her baptism. We're going to be so excited to have her family with us. Next week, we have a guest preacher, Reverend Kim McNair. Uh, she has never preached here before. It's her first time. She's been a preacher for many years. She's preached in Presbyterian churches and Baptist churches. Uh, her main job is working with women who uh, are recovering from domestic violence. She works with an organization called My Sister's Place. And she works uh, in her ministry working to help people to understand how we can work to alleviate poverty and to respond to violence. So she'll be our guest preacher next week. We look forward to that. And the following Sunday, we have our annual Emmanuel 9 commemoration, uh, remembering the nine who were killed at Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston in 2015. Uh, that's been added to our list of church commemorations uh, that we remember each year. If you would like to help with serving uh, lunch at the Carver Center, uh, we take our turn in the rotation. And the next time that we're serving lunch at the Carver Center or dinner, uh, dinner at noon, is on June 17th. And you can let Lorna know if you'd like to help by donating food or by volunteering to help serve food. Um, it's one of those great things that we do where people are working together. And we have our oldest members and our youngest members and people who are connected to the congregation in various ways, helping out. And so I hope you uh, can enjoy that. Um, in case anyone is looking uh, up here and wondering where the paraments are, somebody's gonna go to the altar guild and say, where are the paraments? So I suggested the, to the altar guild um, that for the summer, we just have a simpler setup. Um, you know, two weeks ago we had white here and then last week we had red. Uh, next week it would be green. Um, that for the summer, we could have just a simpler uh, uh, altar space. We have our beautiful new altar uh, dedicated to the memory of Lillian Johnson, which has the beautiful carving on the front. And there's something nice about simplicity. And then when we get back to the autumn and we have um, Reformation Sunday and All Saints Sunday, that'll be the time when the, the empowerments will show kind of the, the specialty um, of, the, uh, of the occasion. So don't criticize the altar guild. Um, that was my suggestion that we try that for the summer. And I'm sorry if we're trying something new again. And I think that's all the announcements. If you would like to stand for the blessing. <clears throat> This is the ancient blessing from Moses' brother Aaron that I offered at the Memorial Day service. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you in mercy and grant you peace. Amen. <clears throat>